My first impression of Jerusalem was primarily a sense of beauty and harmony. Now, it may not be what stands out on your first visit. Instead, life may appear quite chaotic, with millions of tourists and pilgrims and local people running around in this extremely busy city. And there is quite a variety of arts, the famous ceramic tiles, textiles, paintings, icons, layers upon layers of history which you notice through architecture, typical outfits in which the cultural and religious intertwine, food in abundance year-round, in gardens, markets, on the streets, where you hear multiple languages. The whole world comes to Jerusalem, to al the holy, and you hear it. But all of this is Jerusalem. Like the seeds you find in a pomegranate, the fruit you would find everywhere, cut in half on display, ready to be freshly squeezed for a delicious, refreshing juice, or depicted in the most creative ways, on textiles, decorative objects, carved stones, all over the city. You may have seen pieces from Jerusalem dispersed all around the world, disconnected from their place of origin. When you come here, you see how they fit in the bigger picture and the world they create together. Conversely, the whole world comes to Jerusalem and changes it. It's both ways. And I don't think I had ever seen a place like this before. Jerusalem is also the center of a shared life of the three monotheistic religions of the Abrahamic tradition. On any given day, walking down from Damascus Gate, you may see ultra-Orthodox Jews walking to the Western Wall, passing by Muslims going down to or back from the Haram Sharif, the Holy Sanctuary, also known as the Temple Mount, while Christians pray along the Via Dolorosa. Beyond Jerusalem, the land is of astonishing variety and beauty. From the Judean wilderness, its dry hills transformed into green pastures as soon as the first drops of rain fall in the rain season, to the greener western side of the Jordan Rift Valley, to ancient Samaria and Galilee, you move from several thousand feet above sea level to a thousand and more below sea level. All this within 70 miles. Every bit of this land seems to be marked by history. The Battle of the Horns of Atin in the 12th century between the Crusaders and the forces of Sultan Salahadin, after whom the street where St. George's College stands is named, the numerous fortresses King Herod built, the Herodian, Masada, Caesarea Maritima, the innumerable vestiges that excavations keep unearthing. This land, the Holy Land, 
is also for Christians the land of the Holy One, Jesus of Nazareth. It is the land where he was born, lived, taught, performed miracles, was crucified and resurrected. The land is the fifth gospel, through which stories written thousands of years ago come alive. It is a palimpsest of stone, on which multiple layers of narratives have been written. Of course, we cannot see exactly what Jesus saw. The city of Jerusalem has dramatically changed since the first century, as well as many cities all around. But nature, the climate, hills, valleys, give us a sense of continuity. The climate is brutal. I think I had never sensed how important water and salt were before. And these are recurring elements in Jesus' teaching. One then gets a better sense of how strong and fit Jesus was, walking hundreds of miles from Judea to Samaria to Galilee and then back to Judea and Jerusalem. The reality of his body becomes more tangible. Bethlehem, Nazareth, the Dead Sea, the Lake of Tiberias or Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, Caesarea Philippi, Jericho, Magdala. These are not only names of cities and places written in the Bible. They are living places that talk to our intellects, imaginations, our hearts and souls. Often, I wish that stones could tell us what they witnessed. Archaeologists and historians are interpreters for us. They can tell where some of them come from, what they were used for, in which period. And other scientists can tell us, for example, when a certain stone saw natural light for the last time, such as the limestone slab on the rock-cut tomb under the edicule at the Holy Sepulchre, the tomb that tradition remembers as Jesus' tomb. There is something that history and theology can teach us, but there is another form of knowledge that comes from the actual exposure to other cultures, traditions and faiths. For example, to learn more about the practices of ultra-Orthodox Jews has opened my eyes on many passages in the Old Testament which are the living reality of over a million of people in this city. Jerusalem is saturated with religion, and one can be overwhelmed by the abundance of pilgrims, the often overcrowded places of pilgrimage, to the point that it can be hard to connect with the holy. But I think this land did the opposite for me. Thanks to friends who had forewarned me, I did not come expecting to encounter mystery. Rather, what really transformed my staying here was to engage with people from this land and the ordinary, the everyday life that have connected me with the lives of people from the first century. To see people who are holding on to tradition and living today helped me see a continuity between then, the first century and before that, and now. It is at the core of my belief that God is everywhere. God knows no boundary, no border, and nothing can separate us from the love of God. However, boundaries are way too often within ourselves. When God created humankind, God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. Instead, sadly, we know that too often we have created a God after our own image, who is a shadow of ourselves. If we want to get a better sense of the wideness of God, we need to stretch out our representations, to engage with those who are different from us, to listen carefully and empathetically, so that they may have a chance to share their own experiences. As a white Christian, one of the most transforming and enriching experiences I have had here was to meet, engage and worship with local Christians. 
Sometimes they are asked when they converted to Christianity. And some of them very gracefully joke about it and say, Well, I think it happened at Pentecost. Part of this question, I think, comes from the fact that the local Christians we meet are Palestinian Arabs, which in the West we almost immediately associate with Islam, not Christianity. When we hear Arabic language, we think about the Quran, not the Bible. Part of this question also comes from the fact that Christianity in the West has been so predominant for centuries that we could almost believe that it started with us. My church is trying to face itself and acknowledge its complicity with ongoing systemic institutionalized racism. Would it change anything if we, and here I'm talking especially of white Christians, could face the fact that Jesus was a man of this land and that we may more likely see his human face in the face of Palestinian men of today rather than of Caucasian men throughout Western history. Coming here gives us the opportunity to educate our eyes, our ears, our minds and hearts. We see representations that we would otherwise unlikely see in our countries of origin or perhaps in museums. We hear sounds that we may not spontaneously associate with prayer. And we are given the opportunity to suspend, even for a moment, our frameworks, our cultural frameworks, after which we tend to judge, evaluate others with our own criteria, which are filled with biases, prejudices, and again, racism. In short, coming here teaches us humility. St. George's College's setting and ministry are hugely helpful in that regard. Not only does the college stand in East Jerusalem, in what used to be part of Jordan until the Six-Day War in 1967, but it is also a place where one gets a sense of how it feels to live here. The college is served by outstanding staff members who give you a taste of what true hospitality means. Very quickly, you feel at home and in good hands. As you participate in the daily services at the cathedral, in both Arabic and English, you join the constant prayers of Christians in this land and the Anglicans of the Diocese of Jerusalem and the Middle East. The cathedral close, shared by the college and the guesthouse, is of outstanding beauty. The college garden, a biblical garden for the trees and plants you find in it, is expectant with fruits all year long. From pomegranates, olives, to lemons, pomelos, almonds, black mulberries and loquats. Part of the mission of the college is to work for reconciliation. There is a strong commitment to engage with people of other faiths and try and understand the complex situation in Israel and the occupied territories of Palestine. The interreligious dialogue between the three Abrahamic traditions is best expressed through a dedicated course named Sharing Perspectives between Jews, Christians and Muslims, which is an exceptional occasion to learn from one another and talk about the holy envy we may have for one another's religion. But more generally, any course will teach you something about our Jewish and Muslim siblings, as well as our Christians of different traditions, be it due to a religious feast going on, such as Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Hanukkah, Shavuot, or Ramadan, due to particular clothing you may notice on the streets, practices, or the songs you hear on any given day. If our differences may be what we notice more easily from afar, through conversation, careful listening, the privilege of being welcome in worship spaces of other religions, and an open heart, we learn how much we have in common, and practices first alien to us become meaningful. Finally, the college doesn't shy away from the hard questions related to the current situation. Abroad, we may have heard about the Middle East and 
the conflicts and tensions which have been tearing it apart for decades, for centuries. But of course, it's a completely different matter to engage with people of this land, people in this land, to listen to their stories, their narratives, their hopes, their dreams, their sadness. It is a heartbreaking situation in which most people are simply asking for a home, a place where they feel safe, where they can raise their children, where they can have ordinary lives. On a pilgrimage at the college, you visit the Holocaust Memorial, Yad Vashem, a memory and a name. The West Bank, refugee camps, kibbutz, as well as settlements. We get to hear the feelings, the fears, the vulnerability, the distance, and the simple human desire to protect oneself and one's family. One of the most precious times is whenever we get to hear somebody's story, their first-hand experience, their wounds, their disappointments, their hopes, their vision. These are opportunities to open our hearts and imagination, to apprehend the complexity of the situation and expand our compassion. This is, of course, connected to our search for Jesus Christ in the first century. This is all happening and intertwined in the land of the Holy One. If we learn about the human life of Jesus and the context in which he ministered, we also learn and hear and see about his legacy and his presence here and now. So come and see it for yourself.